Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and the Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu. Welcome, folks, to the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And I'm Dr. Bud Marr. We are coming to you from these United States of America, here in the middle of the country, good old Iowa, in Des Moines, on Iowa Catholic Radio, and the Iowa Catholic Radio app, and uh, iowacatholicradio.com. And Anne on the podcast. <laughs> Thank you for all those who listen. I'm Bo Bonner, the senior advisor for admission, uh, not for admissions, for mission initiatives, excuse me, and uh, senior, uh, and then uh, director of the Center for Human Flourishing. Bud, what do you do down at Mercy College? I'm the dean of liberal arts and sciences there. And it's important for us to let you know we both work there because they, of course, underwrite the show, mchs.edu. That's the website you can go check out to see what is up with the people who, like I said, underwrite our show. Thank you, Mercy College, for underwriting the show. It is the middle of summer, but we have people trucking along yeah. um, all through the halls, getting their, uh, well, not degrees done. Most of them getting their degrees started, I should probably say, or they're in the mi- middle of things, the thick of things. Uh, but it's not too late for people. Uh, it's getting close, but not too late if people want to check out uh, fall admissions at mchs.edu. Well, it's not every week that we get to talk about a new venture, but I think since this one is officially rolling out, like we've got the CNA program there you go. at the college now, so I think that'll be a real boon to our community. So, yeah. but we in uh, who do things in medical education oh, yeah. run into okay. a lot of acronyms for the good people. Which what is CNA? It's a certified nursing assistant. And what is ASN? Associate of Science and Nursing. BSN. Forget. No, it's <laughs> bachelor, Bachelors of Science in Nursing. Yeah. Are there other uh, very obvious acronyms I'm missing? DMS, Digital Medical Sonography. Nice. PT. Diagnostic, I think. Di- oh, I'm sorry. Digital. Digital. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about Marshall McLuhan. There you go. Uh, PT. Most of our, yeah, the medical field loves acronyms. One of my things when I am sort of telling people about, uh, it's one of my mission initiative things I do with folks, I start pointing out all of the mnemonic devices and how much we really do love acronyms. And I think it's really like fun. And like, I like pointing out this one for sludge and it's like about like all these like bodily functions. Um, but people think that I, I think I'm teasing sometimes, but I actually think it's really awesome. I'm like, there's so many acronyms. It's so interesting. So look, if you want to heal people, yes. If you want a job that really, uh, is important, but also if you like acronyms, mchs.edu. <laughs> yeah. I think you were at a meeting recently where you use an acronym and someone had to raise their hand and ask you to clarify, but we may have the military almost beat on that. Respect. Yeah, that, I'm, that, you're right. The military probably has a bit more, but okay. I mean, for civilians, we are, we are rather infatuated. You know who doesn't have that many acronyms and we're going to talk about them today. Uh, John Henry Newman. I don't yeah. know if I, I don't know if I've ran into too many acronyms that he uses. No, we're talking about Newman. We actually promised, I think on a previous episode to delve into his idea of a university, which is the great work that he wrote on educational theory, still widely read today. And uh, it, the the listener, you you might at home be chuckling a bit, like talking about school during the heart of the summer, yeah. but <laughs> it's coming quickly. I think this will be a good opportunity for those who uh, have children in school or maybe are educational leaders themselves or just care about the Catholic contribution to the field of education. I think they'll find today's show interesting. Well, also, I mean, part of what you've been looking into also is sort of the history that goes into yeah. um, the, the the birth of him even, even having these thoughts. So, you know, summer's as good a time as any to learn about history. There's a lot of history going on during the summer usually. I don't know about history of, of <laughs> Catholic schools in the British Isles, but, you know, the History mm-hmm. Channel is going to run out of talking about uh, UFOs and Nazis at some point. They're going to have to cover some different stuff, bud. Well, in my mind, it's never a bad time to talk about John Henry Newman. <laughs> and we have a good friend who also has a show on, on the station who kind of gives me a hard time about maybe doing it too often. But I think today's show will be worth your while. A lot of interesting topics to delve into. That's what we need to do. On We need to have uh, a, an uncommon good webpage. And it's instead of like days since last accident, it's like days since 
uh, a show was primarily about John Henry Newman. Hey, our patroness is St. Joan of Arc, so we branched out for that one. That's right. And today is, uh, well, like earlier this week was uh, St. Benedict. So, you know, we, we got the saints covered, people. This is the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> Back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. Bud, as promised, yeah. we're going to talk about John Henry Newman and the idea of a university. Now, real quick, just to get people back in the mindset here, Bud, you are a brilliant scholar, <laughs> expert. People call and ask you questions about Newman. I, I know you're going to be too humble to get into this, but people forget this sometimes. Um You've contributed articles. Now, just real quick, though, for people to sort of your, not your journey of what you know, you know a lot about Newman, but yeah. so your first book you wrote primarily about um, the development of doctrine and like how that was sort of accepted in the history of the time. Is that correct to say? Yeah. And I'm more broadly, maybe his ecclesiology, his theology of the church and how that developed throughout his life, and but so, certainly played into the d- d- development generally. And then past that, like you've had some more articles, some of them about, um, uh, well, some some of the very helpful introductory books for people to like know about John Henry Newman. Yeah. Um, you've also worked on the liturgical aspects, um, sort of the history of what's going on in the modern world that Newman is responding to. You, at the moment, have been working on exactly this idea of John Henry Newman's idea of the university, but wouldn't you even say sort of the the, the grounding or the context about why he decides to write what he does? Well, we were given an interesting assignment. We're co-authoring this article, and it's about how Newman's ideas on these matters can be used to inform contemporary liberal arts education. And so, yeah, that got me thinking a lot about these topics. It's funny because you mentioned sort of my history with Newman, and the idea of a university was not sort of at the forefront of my research. So for me, it's been kind of fun to like kind of dive into this area. Um, What struck me at the start of my research was how hard it was for him to write this book. So this is in the grand scheme. Like when, if you do like a word association game with Newman, you know, what comes to mind for folks is maybe convert or uh, certainly his essay on the development of Christian doctrine is probably the most seminal work that he wrote. But if there's a book by Newman, that's read um, the one that's read most widely today, it's probably this one. And it's because so development of, of doctrine theologians for the most part will be the ones who are interested in that. Well, the idea of a university, the, um, the reach of it expands beyond the borders of Catholicism, beyond the borders of, of, of Christianity. And it's not limited to theologians. So there's university presidents and educational theorists who continue to use and quote this book. So, I mean, it's still, it's still massively popular. And I don't know, like I came across a quote recently. Oh, crud. I think the author's last name was Young. It was a book on like eminent Victorians. And he said, if if you could only save two books about education, you'd want to save what Aristotle wrote and what Newman wrote. And those like, if that's the only thing that could be preserved, um, those two would, would be worth it. Wow. That's a, I mean, that's a very small bookshelf in the bookstore. Uh, it's a cottage industry about like all the books that were written on education. So yeah. it's not like uh, that's a small field if, if someone's saying that, then yeah, that, that shows the imminence of, of their being read. Um, it's interesting with, because I mean, I've taught Idea of the University multiple times. What I think actually is conducive of it is to read the whole thing is important and you start to really see the entirety of the grain of his thought. But you can also just read parts of it. And so I think yeah. that's also part of the enduring nature. And I, because you go to, you know, we're always talking about this in the Newman Reader, newmanreader.org, right? Mm-hmm. Um, with uh, your uh, former workplace and uh, still, you know, great people out there at uh, NINS, the Newman Institute of Newman Studies hosts that. So you can go read this, right? And people do. I I'm, I'm, would be, I would love to see, actually see st- stats, but about like which mm-hmm. parts of that website are access most, access most. But I can tell you within the idea, certain lectures, because these started out as lectures, get read more than others. And, that makes a lot of sense because some really are conducive about, you know, what are we going to do about education now in the modern world? But if you read it front to back, you really do start to say, okay, I'm starting to see what he's really worried about at the time. Yeah. And of course there's some differences, you know, the, the, the 
higher education scene in uh, the United Kingdom in mm. the 1800s, very different than ours. But the concerns, it's one more way in which Newman is very prophetic about what he sees coming down the line. Yeah. And I think sometimes at the time, people kind of just had him pegged as an Oxford dork who sort of liked the old uh, prestige ways too much. But I really think he foretold a lot of the sort of fragmentation that had not even completely ramped up at the time he was worried about it. Yeah, the background to the work is really fascinating because this wasn't sort of an abstract intellectual exercise for him. It flowed out of... so. At the time period, he, he, he first published these or gave the discourses in 1852. And um, at the time, he was being tabbed to help start a Catholic university in Ireland. So for years, you know, the, the Irish had sort of suffered under um, the English rule. And the English, in some cases, they really prohibited the type of the amount of education that the Irish were provided. So, I mean, I was reading some crazy accounts of like basically... You know how um, during like post-Reformation England that sometimes they had to have priests say mass in hiding very quickly? Right. Yep. The Irish sometimes had to do this with like education. So they would set up like basically schools and sometimes like outdoors, you know, like in the forest or whatever. But at, um, at the time period that Newman is formulating these lectures, that's kind of loosening up. And there are English who feel some sympathy for the plight of the Irish and so there's a push to have what's called Queen's Universities, where any citizen of the United United Kingdom could could attend these. And it's it's interesting to dive into the history because, you know, today when we sometimes like when we have these like Catholic lively discourses, it feels like, man, why do things have to be so tough? Well, this is a part of church history. So even the bishops in Ireland aren't all on the same page about like what's the best course of action. So some say, well, as long as we send the right kind of student who's like properly formed and rooted will these like corrupt them these to attend what's called um they use the uh they use the phrase like mixed education right so mixed education would be catholics and protestants studying together well eventually rome rules on the matter and for them what's what's ultimately significant is they they say like there's really no idea of like a neutral education and it's not so much a matter of the students being together per se, but like the guidance that they'll get from their mentors and from their educators will be ultimately committed to principles that are inimical to the Catholic faith. And so they say like, um, if, if the Irish leadership is going to proceed, they need to establish a truly like Catholic university. There's already like a seminary in Ireland at the time, but they, they start to want to have to, they start to want to give, Irish Catholics, the sort of education that was afforded to Protestants. And so Newman is tabbed like Archbishop Colin, um, who's like the figurehead of the Irish Episcopacy. He really wants Newman because Newman already has like, he's, he's famous as um, not only as a priest, but as a literary figure. So he'll provide some heft to the university. And as part of this project, he says, can you write these discourses or give them, I should say. And what's interesting to that. So that's the sort of setup for why Catholics an English Catholic is invested in Irish education. What's interesting is immediately out of the gate, Newman starts talking about what has to be the most <laughs> overlooked aspect in the idea. I think a lot of people give it their best shot. They'll even read some of the more boring chapters about, you know, like rhetoric or how you do math, you know, lessons. Yeah. But what I am almost sure, but most people miss is he starts naming specific people in the English debate about universities. Mm. So coterminous with this, what's Ireland going to do and what is the best thing to do for Irish education and Catholic education in general and this idea about a unified body of knowledge, Newman has, as someone uh, very interlaced in Oxford world, even after he's converted, the arguments that are setting up universities that would be by straight up the utilitarians, really. I mean, so you have like, the disciples of, of, of Bentham and Mill who are getting, and you correct me, what, what are they calling the colleges? They're not calling them the public colleges, but it's not the King's colleges either. I'm blanking on this one, but what they're setting up is essentially a more modern idea of the university, the sort of the anti Oxfords, right? Mm -hmm. That we're going to go train people. And it is, they don't call them trade schools yet. And the trade schools we would think in mind, we would have in mind, you know, like Votech, but what they're meaning is, 
let's skip this whole running around doing the Oxford Cambridge tutor sort of things and get straight to making people emergent careers like engineers, right? Mm -hmm. You start to see the industrial revolutions press on the university system. And so this idea of being useful to the nation, you start to see Newman mentioning this. And this I think is where he's the most contemporary. And it's not like you, if you don't understand all these people and who they are, you can't understand the idea of the university. But I do think, but if people are going to go read that and they run into these names, they should know that Newman has in mind the debate that's already started full tilt in England where they're trying to create different universities with a very different end in mind. And he sees that sort of yeah. tempting even the big schools like Oxford and Cambridge. Well, those are some really helpful comments because to me reading this book, it's almost like reading one of St. Paul's epistles. Like you'll get into these arguments and they're already midstream. And so having, you know, I, sometimes I, I hate to kind of recommend this because like, I think there is a way in, for instance, in which you can read the Bible and get a lot out of it without delving deeply into the historical context. And the reason I say I hate recommending that is like, you know, so many of us are already pressed for time and energy. And so not everyone has the time or the wherewithal to get into some of like the secondary literature. But when reading a book like The Idea of a University, it can help to know like what lies in the background. And what you're talking about there, like the way that colleges were kind of changing and the way that they're heading, that's why Newman spends a whole section talking about knowledge as its own end, Absolutely. as an end in itself. But you have to sort of have that context to fully grasp what he's talking about. He starts the book with theology as a branch of knowledge. Yeah. And I think you talk about some of the commentary that's been done on the idea of a university. I think we can offer some helpful correctives today. Cause if you come to this book, um, sort of, uh, uninitiated, so to speak, and just jump into it, you might assume Newman's concern is just like, you got to have a theology department. You got to have a theology department because he, that's sort of his background. That's his area of expertise. And maybe he's just trying to like give himself some job security or something like that. Nice. But it really is for him, a question about the nature of truth. And so in line with the great scholastic thinkers like St. Thomas Aquinas, he wants to argue that theology is a science. It's a disciplined study that gives us genuine knowledge. It operates with a different kind of rationality than does what we call the physical sciences. So he says it's deductive because you're drawing conclusions from revelation. But I think the thrust of that entire argument is he points out that well, I mean, he says, so we don't have to get into his etymology. Some folks say he got this wrong, but I think like th th it was an accepted understanding of the word university and he's working from that standpoint. So he says a university by its very name purports to teach universal knowledge. And if it leaves out theology or philosophy as a, as a branch of science, then it's, well, what he says is like, it's actually staking a claim about the nature of the world and what can be known about reality. So by doing this, you're not achieving like a heightened form of objectivity. You're saying there's nothing that can be known about God. And he points out like, that's a substantive claim that can and needs to be contested. Right. That they're just assuming who people, what are they saying? He got wrong about the university. What are they, they saying the etymology is what? Yeah. I mean, there's just sort of questions about like how that term arose and if like the the central or crucial meaning was like universal knowledge. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sh fine. So if, if he got the etymology wrong, as far as the history of it, fine. Yeah. Certainly the case, what you start to go, what else would you call this thing that purports to, I mean, I uh, fine. What I, I, I don't know what else we're saying. If it's not you, it's at least yeah. unitary knowledge, right? Yeah. It's at least the, I, it, at least it's getting the sim, the semblance of the oneness or the connectedness yeah. of things. Um, which is a huge point to him. Yeah. That's what I, so I'm man, that sounds like cottage industry stuff. Like people trying to like yeah. make a book. I know that's shots fired, but it really is analogous to historical criticism when it comes to like the new Testament and things and folks kind of act like if they can complicate the history, right that all of a sudden you can sort of start to question the truth claims that are being made. Yes. You know, I think it's interesting to act like what's going on with Victorian understandings of, um, philo philology, 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 philology. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, that if you can be like the etymology is wrong, you're, they're like, well, never mind. I don't believe in Christianity anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. it's sort of like here's one more way to talk about the history of a word coming about. Whatever. To me, in the similar light, I've heard people who go, oh. Well, Newman has an overly wooden understanding about the distinction between education and instruction. Oh. And I'm sort of used to this in reading um, philosophy of education people. They'll go, he's sort of overdetermined it, right? And again, sort of based on a, an etymology, because what eudicare means, opening of the mind, the traveling of the mind, I forget. But then instruction, the, what it gets down to is he, he's, he has this etymology that he lays out. But the important thing, and I've, I'm on record saying this, you can come up with whatever two words you want. Newman has a point, and it's a legit distinction, that there's knowledge that seems to be about knowledge itself. It's, it's, mm -hmm. It is the feature of a mind that has been formed for the sake of forming it. And then there is usage of knowledge where you learn to do a task. And it can po it's completely the case if like people are saying they, they're like reading Newman too woodenly, that sure, you should learn skills and the ability to do tasks at, at college. You should learn to write or something like this. Fine. And that involves instruction is what he's calling it. Mm -hmm. But his point is to say instruction happens all over the world. You can be instructed in all sorts of places. Children are instructed about how to eat with manners. Um, someone who is doing great works that are labor intensive like uh, construction, but, or, mm -hmm. you know, learning to do woodworking, but they're instructed how to do it, right? The, this is the method in which you go and you manipulate the world. Education or whatever you want to use for that different term is a formation of the intellect akin to the formation of the soul when it becomes moral mm -hmm. or the formation of the body when it becomes healthy. And that idea, right, is you become healthy for its own sake. You become moral for its own sake. And you do this thing, this education thing for its own sake. Yeah. All of this instruction is for the sake of something else. Why that goes back to what you were saying with theology mm -hmm. is it might be the case. Indeed, it is. I'll even throw this out. And he didn't. If you lop off part of the circle of knowledge, so-called, it will be easier to teach all of it. Mm -hmm. But then it's not for its own sake. You're doing it for some other reason. And his argument Un, if not explicit implicitly in the theology argument is if knowledge is worth getting for its own sake, if education is good for its own sake, you have to do it completely and you can't shy away from something just because it's difficult or massive or big or takes a lot of commitment like theology. Well, I, I think it's important that you use that phrase circle of knowledge and you kind of theoretically talked about lopping part of it off. He says, because knowledge forms a unified whole, that the different branches of study complement and correct each other. And so if you, if you, if you lop um, one field of knowledge off, and we don't have to necessarily assume it would be theology, we could say like another field like philosophy or economics, whatever it happens to be, he says what happens is that you create a vacuum, and then that vacuum is filled by other sciences that, so to speak, like step outside of their lane. I know I'm mixing metaphors there. <laughs> But we, I, you know, I think he was really prophetic in that regard. You look today at someone like Richard Dawkins, who, you know, I think he's a, he's a renowned biologist, but he decided at one point in his career, like, I'm going to start addressing metaphysics and has done so really poorly. I mean, people joke that like his book, Atheist Delusions, wouldn't, um, what, wouldn't probably, no, that's not right. That's the response to it. The God delusion there you go. probably wouldn't pass muster like an introductory philosophy course. But it's sort of like this, I've got this expertise as a scientist, and now I'm going to opine on this, but does a really poor job. But for Newman, it really is. That's where he calls philosophy the architectonic science. It's the one that kind of rules over all of them in the sense of trying to explain how they're unified or how, they're, how they relate to one another. And so, like, I mean, you could do this in all sorts of examples. Like, the economists, really, like, what's the science of economics? It's about wealth, like wealth creation, but the morality of that or how we should practice that in everyday life or for the economist to try to judge, um, make a judgment about happiness would be sort of like stepping outside of his lane. I don't want to say like theology and philosophy just deal with like questions of meaning or, or morality because for Newman, it goes deeper than that, but that's kind of how he starts to, to think about those matters. Yeah. And early on, he's trying to point out that in order to 
make a claim otherwise is to make a judgment already in large matters. So he makes the point that if you acted like the 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 the, the top of the mountain of moral concern is something like duty, then sure the the soldier should go and perform whatever the general says. But we all know that there's higher callings on the human that, so to speak, call into question ultimately anything you might do and then ask, does it ultimately make you happy? Is that ultimately the best good? Um, you know, so then you can question everything from the soldier to the nurse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is like, what is going to unify those concerns? And he gets that. So on one hand, theology can't be off topic. Obviously, it's going to branch out and be a concern for many other things. But this habit of mind has to be there or we won't get to it at all. So this is the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr. Stick around. We'll be back right after this. Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner, Dr. Bud Marr joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show. We are talking about the idea of the university with John Henry Newman, revisiting some of those ideas. But I'm going to flip it back over to yeah. you about what is, uh, you know, mm-hmm. questions coming to your mind regarding the seminal work. Well, I think this book can be of interest to a broad audience because Newman treats a lot of the questions that I think Catholics of all stripes are sort of concerned about today. So you and I both work in higher education and one popular topic is Catholic identity. So if it, if a school says it's Catholic, if they put crucifixes on the wall, if they have, you know, Catholic in the name, what does that mean for their actual way of life? And Newman of course, doesn't use the phraseology Catholic identity. Like that would not be, it wasn't in the water at his time, but he really gets into a lot of these questions. And Bo, for me, what's fascinating is that like, if you sort of go into it with presuppositions about what you think he'll say, I think you'll be surprised. So, you know, like you think about Newman, he's a saint. He wrote all these books about Christianity and Catholicism. So maybe he's just like gung ho about like, let's just make it um, as Catholic as possible, robustly as, as Catholic as it possibly can be. And I'm not saying Newman doesn't say that. Sorry for the devil negative. But it looks a little bit different than I think people push Catholic identity today because for him, it really goes back to these foundational questions about the nature of truth and the nature of education. So like one example that I'd give you that I think surprises people is he's, he's very much upfront about the fact that education doesn't sanctify us. Right. It's really the sacraments as mi- administered by the church. That, that's the means that God's used to make us holy. And so he he sort of like cautions folks about like assuming too much in that regard. And it it goes back to all the way in his Anglican days. So he was, before he became Catholic, he was battling this idea in England that like a non-sectarian education could make the populace more moral. So he wrote this book called The Tamworth Reading, Reading Room. And it was really a response to a proposal by a guy named Robert Peel, who I think was prime minister at some point, but like an important sort of figure in England at the time. He said, well, if you just like, if you create these public libraries and give people books, but don't have any theology books there, like they'll read and through osmosis, they'll become better people. And Newman says like, no, those are sort of two different endeavors. Funny enough, he says like a liberal education, what ends up producing is something more like a gentleman, like a polished individual who can weigh different ideas and things. And so he wants us to be sort of honest about what are we tackling? What's like the, the fundamental purpose of education? And so what most people imagine being a robustly Catholic education is exactly the moral aspects that he would think is not the primary point of especially higher education. And sometimes catechetical, like that's where we sort of transmit the fundamentals of the faith. Absolutely. So for, for Newman... He sort of sides with uh, most of the ethics students I've ever had first day of class. Because you can tell they're saying something to the effect, why am I in this ethics class with this dude I've never met? My mom has taught me all the ethics I need. And I go, you're correct. If you're not moral by the time you're taking my ethics class, I'm not changing that. I'm not the solution. Ethics in a university class 
is the science of being able to intellectually think through and judge ethical systems, moral decisions, which people get, hopefully, from their parents, their friends, their families, their confidants, etc. So it's, it's confusing, and I think this ethics example is a good one, Bo, uh, Bud, because you go, okay, that is, it seems like, oh, we're trying to teach them good morals, and you go, no, what we're doing for the intellectual perfection that is the ha- philosophical habit of mind is we want people to get an education that allows them for its own sake to make judgments about ethical systems, but to be ethical and moral instruction is much more like a catechesis and then B moral formation in the home. So again, this can also be confusing because certainly primary education usually has a, a large element of both catechesis and moral formation. But even then I think Newman above all, bud would say, Moral formation really has to happen in the domestic church of the home. The school will not be able to do that ultimately. But certainly by secondary education, he is arguing that the idea of a university says we are here to to perfect the the powers of the intellect, which just like a healthy person will probably be able to read more books or, you know, have a better moral life, all things considered, because they aren't in physical distress so that they can you know, either get good habits or dwell on things. He goes, as you say, there's no guarantee because to become smarter is not to necessarily become better on virtue. Just like becoming smarter doesn't mean that you're necessarily healthier of body. Those things all mutually enforce each other, but are not necessary in themselves. I think this is one of the largest misreads or at least misapplications, bud, Mm -hmm. of the idea of a university. Because Newman would have you sort out your intellectual house before you then go, okay, but also how are we going to promote our students' health and also their moral life? But for him, a university can promote those things, but what the university does is about universal knowledge. And he thinks, to your point, there is a Catholic way to do that. There's a Catholic difference to that approach, and it's not just attending to the moral and health aspects of the student. There is a Catholic way to approach the unity of truth. Well, I think another way that Newman would surprise modern readers is that he has a, um, and, and, and some of the commentators have talked about this. He has a surprising openness for his time with respect to who, who the students read. And so we already talked about on the first half of the show, how uh, Rome was opposed to mixed education and they really pushed for the establishment of a, uh, a truly Catholic university in Ireland. So you'd think with that sort of mindset that maybe Newman at the helm would say, we're only going to read Catholic authors, but you don't get this in the idea of a university or in how we actually structured the curriculum. So Newman was sort of like, for lack of a better term, progressive in the sense that he wanted the students to read uh, John Locke and um, Edward Gibbon. So Gibbon had written sort of a, um, history of the fall and decline of the Roman empire. And he kind of blamed Christianity for Rome's downfall. And so Newman said though, like you can't, you can't replace Gibbon. There's not like, there's not like a Catholic version of this. And, and, you know, he had them read, had his students read Protestant authors and things like that. Now, um, for those of us who are leaders in education or like parents, as you think about the school you want to send your children to, like, obviously there's prudential questions about like the sort of like, what's the reading list going to be. But I did, I do appreciate like going back to him today, his openness to like, he didn't think that you gained a lot by having your students just kind of head, like um, shove their head in the sand. There's a, there's a time and a place to introduce them to these thinkers, but there's something that is gained from reading Gibbon that you can't gain elsewhere. And it's important sort of like, I think about the, the an analogy to the X-Men movie where they like step into the octagon. They've got like the virtual reality combat chamber. Nice. Yes. <laughs> And so it's better sometimes for our students to encounter Gibbon or Nietzsche or even, well, I don't know, Sartre. <laughs> Sartre. Yeah, well, bad example. You're kinda, Just because he's boring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, to encounter some of these thinkers with um, tutors who care about them there and are go. deeply rooted in the Catholic faith and to kind of guide them along the way. So this was, I'm glad you mentioned tutors. This would be the second thing I think most people miss about both the practical form of what was going on when Newman is talking about a university and certainly what I think we're messing up now 
The reason we throw a lot of weight behind, oh, we better get the reading list right, is because we have a very strange notion about what ultimately happens at a university. So on one hand, it's hard for people to really, I think, understand this, but in the British system, lectures, I even think this pertains today, but at least at the time that Newman is, is doing this, you could sort of attend whatever lectures you wanted. Lectures were open and not mandatory. What was mandatory was meeting with your tutor, and you had to prove to your tutor that you have actually digested whatever book has been assigned. And it is that personal influence of the tutor, both in you know oral examination, speaking together, and then in writing, that really pushes forward this idea of, have you really chewed on the book and absorbed and, uh, you know, digested the ideas this yes it's very text oriented but it's a dialectic a, a dialogue understanding right like embodied through the mouth of the tutor so the lecturer of course is a master who has deeply imbibed whatever book this is not necessarily like you said that it's completely right but you know even if they're disagreeing with Locke they really know you know the treatise and they are really diving deep in it and so the apprentices, which are the students, they sit back and listen to the lecture of the master, but it's with the tutor, A, and then B, this is the most surprising part, I think he says, it really is with the sort of hashing it out with each other that the students make progress in forming the philosophical habit of mind. Because again, Newman's goal is not a content test at the end. For him, the most important thing is to give the time and resources necessary to make the deep connections between all of this stuff, even the people you ultimately disagree with. What does he say famously, bud, that if you had to choose between great professors or a library and room for the students to hash out what they read, he'd choose the latter. Yeah. So in fact, yep. I I pulled it up while you were talking. So he was kind of, you and I were privileged to study under Stanley Harawas, a great living ethicist. And Hauerwas, to me, is like the theologian of hyperbole. He'll kind of make these statements, and he won't, like, very strongly worded statements to sort of shock you awake, you know? Um, So Newman, when he's talking about this topic, Bo, he says that I I protest to you, gentlemen, that if I had to choose between a so-called university which dispensed with residents and tutorial superintendents and gave its degree to any person who passed an examination on a wide range of subjects and a university which had no professors or examinations at all, but merely brought a number of young men together for three or four years, I would definitely side with the latter. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so he says, like, if the choice is between, um, ha- like, dispensing with tutorial and residence, um, but having these, like, rigorous exams, and then just, like, a place that brings students together for a period of three or four years, he would, he, you know, he would go with, like, that sort of, like, lively community. And it, go- it all goes back to, there's a phrase that was really important to him, uh, you know, when he came to the University of Ireland, some people were like, well, he's just importing English ideas about education because he did use Oxford as his model. But the reason like he loved Oxford so much was precisely because of its colleges and students were in residence. And these residences became true intellectual communities where there was lively exchange. I mean, he almost has this like biblical notion of iron sharpens iron. And there's something that you get from that encounter that can't be replicated even by, even by reading books. But certainly, um, you know, I think, I think he would be opposed to distance education for the most part. Um, that 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 this coming together under the same roof, for him it was like he's like these different these experts from different fields. They're rivals of each other, and in that exchange, you sort of forge the fires of truth uh, and this common search for the good, the the beautiful and the true. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's the, the sort of call for us in the digital age in very different circumstances. When you think about the sheer expense of bringing people together in residence, at least as imagined by most colleges, mm-hmm. that seems to be what people <laughs> are trying to get away from because exactly the expense. And so they go, how do we, how do we streamline the curriculum part? And then people rightfully worried about that pushback and go, no, the curriculum is more than half the whole. And we get in these big discussions about what is the canon, for instance. And again, but this is what has driven my interest in this for so long is uh, the great books 
especially through John Sr. and the monks at Clear Creek and, and knowing those people so well, it was an awakening in my life. And I realized that looking back before I really knew the term, that was what appealed to me about philosophy is that are these great thinkers with these great books. And it wasn't a matter of just learning by rote what they argued, but wrestling with them that, you know, made all the difference in my life. But what I started to realize is it wasn't the con. It wasn't like, oh, well, if you just get the right content, the Mortimer Adler version of the great books, if you get the 50 right books, everyone will be fine. This is like you were saying, um, uh, Lord Chancellor P- Peel, uh, I think, was saying something similar. And it's obviously not true because like the 50 great books, even if you go, I mean, the people would argue what's on it, but just go with Mortimer Adler's University of Chicago, 50 great books. Those don't agree, right? I mean, it has everything from Plato and Aristotle disagreeing with each other, but Lucretius was an atheist. I mean, you know, you go through all of this. Mm-hmm. And so it can't be the case that you go, if you get the right ingredients, you get this special fast food version of the truth called the great books. I mean, it's like sort of the very opposite of what's being argued about. So to me, you can, (laughs) there can actually be sort of a a wide swath of arguing about which books are best and why they are. I mean, I have my opinions and of course they're correct, but, but uh, to me, this is the, the crux of the matter is how do we make sure people have this personal influence that allows them to exercise this philosophical habit of mind. Obviously, and I think rightly, Newman points out, having people under a roof where for four years they don't do anything else but that is optimal. If we can't do that, like if we don't have the leisure, if we've made an economy where that can't happen, on one hand, we do the best we can, but on the other, I think we should seriously ask if we have the right economy, if we don't allow that sort of thing to happen. But then the secondary thing is, how do we approximate it best for the most Catholics? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what starts to be interesting. I do think having people in the same room hashing it out, but like knowing each other over a long enough period of time to love each other in this pursuit is best. If we can't do that though, but even when it comes to something like digital education, you would do it way different yeah. because what people seem to act like digital education is like, oh, well, we have all of the readings there. Just read through it. You'll be fine. And you go, no. The matter is how do you get people, again, to talk about these things? So they need to have, they need to have someone they can imitate in that way of life, and then they need to have the sort of circumstances and the support to do that. I don't think it's impossible to imagine that online. Mm-hmm. That's just not what people are doing. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, right before your comment, I described Newman as sort of like the, the great theologian of hyperbole during his time. I think another thing that um, he was really good at was holding two ideas in tension. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, it's important to keep that in mind as you go about like jumping into his work a little bit. So when you come across the section in the idea of a university that's really anti-utilitarian and talks about knowledge being an end in itself, You can sort of, you might come away thinking like, well, Newman was mostly about impracticality. Mm. And that wasn't the case because, in part, because one of the big questions that he faced is like, the Irish were like, if we make this great sacrifice to send um, our kids to the school and to undertake this liberal education, like, what's that going to mean for the direction of their lives? Uh, I think another, another point that kind of pushes against this sort of idea that, you know, he was... It, like the idea was impracticality was um, the medical school was really like the jewel of the university or it became that way. And so it was important to him. I think they, I'm second guessing myself now on air, but like the medical school, and I think they had a lot of um, like pre lawyers. And so like there was, there's that wing of the college. I know you've written on his views on medicine, but it wasn't, it wasn't sort of like um, a total resistance to the idea that you would have a career at the end of your studies it was really about the organization of the curriculum and how you approached the relationship between the different parts of the curriculum. I mean, I think here at the end, you know, we're getting done here. I would argue what he's saying is the only way you can create an intellect that won't be, as it were, overrun by the power of the knowledge that a career would have is to have an educated soul, one that is deeply formed in the unity of knowledge and the fact that knowledge is worth it for its own sake. 
He's not saying that, you know, we need to make more, like you said, impractical medicine or, it's, you know, medicine should only be for, you know, goofy eggheads that live in an ivory tower. What he's saying is something like medicine is so powerful and so obviously good in what it was doing. And by the way, he's saying that in the 19th century. His point's even more salient now. What he's saying is the only way to not be seduced by its success and let it answer questions it can't which if you have any knowledge of medicine or medical education, you know this is a standing issue. The only way that this will not happen and befall to your students is if they have that philosophical habit of mind that, that allows them to understand where even something like healing and the knowledge thereof exists on the entire circle of knowledge. Mm-hmm. So it's not that it's, Oh, th- only be Im- impractical. His point is to say when knowledge is love for its own sake, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be yours beside. That's a sort of similar thing. To love knowledge for its own sake, you'll get all of these benefits. But one of the chief ones is to not let the allure and the power of other knowledges mow you down, yeah. bowl you over, and you will be able to live in a holistic, flourishing way rather than becoming a servant of the knowledge that uh, you've obtained. So this is the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner, Dr. Budmar, stick around. We'll be back right after this. Back with the Uncommon Good. Bob Bonner, Dr. Budmar, joining you this week. Thank you for listening to the show, whether that be on the airwaves of Iowa Catholic Radio, the iowacatholicradio.com, Iowa Catholic Radio app, on all of our podcasts. Thank you for making sure to stop by. Bud, I hope that we, of course, are doing this so that the the benefit of the people who hear it. But I know in many ways, we Mm -hmm. too often are the beneficiaries of getting to have this time together to talk about things. So I do hope that this uh, was able to Speak to that appetite rumbling in your intellectual tummy about uh, the uh, idea of the university. Yeah, one thing that's fun about the show that I really appreciate is, like we mentioned in the intro today, St. Joan of Arc. We talked about John Henry Newman. I think it was this year, time flies, when uh, we did um, Augustine's Confessions. And I really feel and hope like sometimes the show is like a manifestation of the communion of saints. Like it's really cool to have all this conversation about these towering figures of the faith and just have this going out on the airwaves, you know, as people drive through the state or whatnot. I mean, my big hope is that even though it's just the two of us, I hope some of you get a chance to either read or just through listening, get to have what Newman is talking about, which of course is not some sort of uh, distance program where after you listen to us yokels talk about these things, you could somehow go pass a test, but that hopefully it has helped you wrestle and develop some of that philosophical habit of mind. So, Bud, speaking of, uh, you know, that's the intellectual life, but also for the good of the spiritual life here at Iowa Catholic Radio, we make sure to try to pray together. Do you mind telling folks when and where, well, when they can do that? Yeah, we broadcast the Rosary on air on, at 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. And then later in the afternoon, 2.55, we have the Chapel of Divine Mercy. Excuse me, we hope you can um, join us in those prayer times but also anytime, anywhere, you can access the Iowa Catholic Radio app. And if you go to iowacatholicradio.com and go to events, you can see what is up in the Iowa Catholic Radio listening area. So, for instance, August 2nd in West Des Moines at Iowa Catholic Radio, first Friday mass. Join the staff and friends of Iowa Catholic Radio Network every Friday, first Friday, excuse me, for the celebration of Holy Mass at the Chapel of St. Gabriel the Archangel. Um, August 8th through 18th at the Iowa State Fairgrounds, Fair Fever. Join Iowa Catholic Radio staff and friends to station each day out at the State Fair. And then, of course, September 28th through 29th at Wells Fargo Arena, Christ Our Life Conference. Tickets, information, descriptions of all that's going on, you can go do that at iowacatholicradio.com on the events page. Of course, folks, this ministry, which that's what this is, this is more than just the folks on air, behind the boards, or behind the desk. This ministry is yours, and it's only made possible through the gifts and donations that you give us. We want to thank you for people who donate their time, talent, and treasure, the volunteers that we see, the people praying for us, but of course, also the material gifts that you give. If not for your gifts uh, and donations, we would not be able to do this wonderful work. So please consider to give uh, if you've already given, thank you, but please consider making that gift regular. You can give at iowacatholicradio.com on the donate button, Iowa Catholic Radio app, or call 515-223-1150 or text 515-223-1150 to talk to folks about donating. Thank you once more for all that you do for Iowa Catholic Radio, The Uncommon Good, our local shows, and the national feed as well. We appreciate it. Bud, 
As always, thanks for stimulating conversation. I hope uh, it reaches some people on a weekend to get the old noggin rolling. Yeah, it's always fun. Thanks, Bo. This is the Uncommon Good. May Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, family, city, station, solar system, (laughs) galaxy, the whole kit and caboodle. This is the Uncommon Good, and we'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and The Uncommon Good provided by Mercy College of Health Sciences. Learn more at mchs.edu.